So now that we've done the experiment, now we're going to go back and look at our data. So what we've done is we've kind of done a run of four different experiments where we've altered the concentrations of acetone, the H plus uh, from the acid, and the iodine concentration. So these three are all my initial concentrations divided by five because I took 10 milliliters of each and ended up with a 50 milliliter volume solution. So each of those was diluted by a factor of five. And then what I did is, in my different experiments, I would hold two of them constant while doubling in one of them. So here I doubled the acid concentration. In experiments one and three, I doubled the acetone. In experiments one and four, I doubled the iodine and left everything else the same. Then what I did was I, I took the time and I, and I rounded it pretty generously here because, let's be honest, it's a, it's a pretty big source of error is that we're not really exactly sure where that moment cuts off, where the reaction is complete. Uh, so we took the initial concentration of the iodine, in this case it's 0 0.001, divided by the time, and got a rate for that. Okay. Then in the second experiment, same thing, same concentration, but now I divide by the different time, and I get a new value. Okay. Third experiment, I divide by this time, I get a new value. Fourth experiment, now I have double the iodine concentration, so I divide that by the, the time, and I get a new value. What I find is, is that by doubling the acid, my rate goes up by 2.17. So given that we have some flexibility here, what that suggests is that uh, the H plus is first order. I kind of doubled the H plus and my rate approximately doubled. For the acetone in experiments 1 and 3, I double the acetone and then I get 2.3 times the rate. So again, we're looking at a case where we're looking at a first order reaction for acetone. So first order for acetone, first order for H+, and the experiment suggests that iodine is zero order, and when we look, we change the concentration of iodine, my rate goes up a little bit, but enough, enough that, close enough to one that that's what we would choose in that particular instance. If this were above 1.5, then we might go back and look and, and redo some things, but for this, the, the closest answer to that is zero order. So we end up with the following rate law. We end up with rate is equivalent to our constant times the acetone to the first power times the H plus to the first power and the iodine is to the zero power. We can leave that out. Then what you can do through is you can go ahead and plug in the values of acetone and H plus and your rate in molarity per time, molarity per second in this case, and you can solve for the rate constant. Okay, so when I did that for one of my experiments, I came up with 0 .000, 0 .000212, molarity to the minus one, cancel one of the concentrations, time to the minus one. What we're going to do in our next experiment is we're then going to raise the temperature and lower the temperature to get rate constants for this rate law at different temperatures. Now when I change the temperature, the rate law will stay the same, but the rate constant will change within that. Okay, based on the Arrhenius equation. So the rate can change, go up or down, this can go up or down, but my concentrations and my exponents will remain the same. Okay? So here I went ahead and reran the experiment um, and did so at different temperatures. So once with a colder temperature, got a rate, plugged into the rate law, found the rate constant, took the natural log of that, and took one divided by the temperature. Okay. Then, I had to go down a little bit to kind of get there, but I ran it again at a higher temperature, so it's only a difference of 15, but my rate is considerably different. It's uh, over three times as much, or about three times as much. So I took the natural log of that, I got um, uh, this value, and, or I found the rate constant, took the natural log of that, and then I also went ahead and took the reciprocal of the time. So next what I did, was I went ahead and constructed a graph. And what I plotted on that graph was, on the one side, I plotted the natural log of K. Okay, and I got two data points here and here. On this side, I put one divided by temperature on the Kelvin scale. Okay, so one over 300 and whatever. And then I got my two points and I constructed a line. And I found the slope of that line, so essentially I did the difference in the natural log of K values divided by the difference in the 1 divided by temperature values. Okay, and from that slope, what we know is, is that the slope of that line, which I calculated, is equal to the activation energy divided by the constant R. 
So when I found that slope, I then went ahead and multiplied it by negative r to get what the activation energy is. The r value you're using for this is at 8.314. Okay, it's your physics E, the Pascal's one. And that will give you activation energy in units of joules per mole. And you'll have to make sure, so the slope here is negative, and so if you just want to count the slope as a positive value and ignore that negative, they, they're on both sides. But you can solve for the activation energy, okay? So that's what you want to do to kind of, kind of come to a conclusion on what your, how your experiment ran, find the activation energy after finding the rate law and the rate constants of different temperatures.